and say that three times. That's, um, alliteration is always something I like a lot. I like a lot of initials that occur, but sometimes that can be an issue. So just take a quick look and think about big, bad, baclofen, two sides of that same coin. So we're going to start off with a simple case study. This is Mr. BT. He's a 20-year-old man. He was found by his friend lying unconscious with a pulse, but unconscious on the floor of his apartment. And he was brought to the emergency department by ambulance, by EMS. He, very, he is now awake, but very, 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 um, very disoriented and stuporous, falling asleep, waking up, falling asleep. Very important to kind of look at that perspective. And his vital signs present a picture of somebody who might be quite acutely ill, right? His temperature is not, not particularly high, but his heart rate and his respiratory rate are elevated. So we have some concern about him. His pupils were 2.5 millimeters millimeters in diameter bilaterally and he had a beautiful reaction to light. He had a no no nuchal rigidity because of that, of course, that was one of the main concerns in the first evaluation of the patient. And there were no carotid ruies detected and heart, lungs, vascular system, abdomen, all normal. Everything looks pretty normal, except he's found unconscious. He's, uh, he's obviously disoriented. And we have some concerns about what's occurring for this patient. So on a further neurologic evaluation, strength of his upper and lower limbs looks pretty good. They're equal. But when actually applying uh, re deep tendon reflex studies, it's seen that his knee jerks are normal, but his ankle jerks are decreased bilaterally. So right away, you have some consideration. Is this, uh, is this an ascending paralysis? Could it be Guillain-Barre? And he also had positive Babinski sign bilaterally. So now you're, God, what could this be? This is so strange, this presentation. And now the patient has become awake and agitated and significantly agitated, very restless. And uh, again, very disoriented. His tox screen comes back and it's negative for narcotics, for cocaine, for amphetamines and he has a normal CT. So remember in the ECC, you're throwing out a really wide net. You don't really know what's going on with the patient. You're trying to make a good diagnosis with not very much information. So I'm only sharing the abnormal labs that were evaluated initially on this patient. Elevated white count. Okay, well now we're thinking maybe this is sepsis. Maybe it's meningitis. That would uh, explain all these signs and symptoms. Not really, not really hyperthermic, but it does explain some of the signs and symptoms, although he doesn't have, remember, nuchal rigidity. So was it encephalopathy? What else might be going on? His urine is positive for myoglobin and his CK is 10,000. So now we say, oh, maybe this is rhabdomyolysis. But remember, rhabdomyolysis is never the actual diagnosis. It's a symptom of a secondary issue, like being found down, which, of course, he was found down. So some of the things you have to think about with this patient is, does he have hyperthyroidism? He has this restless agitation. He's lysing his muscles. Could he be hyperthyroid? Doesn't really look that way because he's not tachycardic. He's not hypertensive. So you're thinking there might be some thyroid dysfunction, but no, that was ruled out. Second thing is, is he septic? He's got an elevated white count. And is that why he's lysing his muscles and he has a positive urine myoglobin and an elevated CK? Sepsis doesn't really explain though the neurologic uh, complications here that we're seeing with this patient where, where he has alterations in his deep tendon reflexes and where he's gone from unconscious to agitated in a relatively short period of time. Of course, you already know he's got rhabdo because he's got a positive urine myoglobin. Remember, that is the pigment from the red uh, skeletal muscles. As you break skeletal muscles apart, you flood the kidney with myoglobin. And really, there's only one reason that you're going to see positive myoglobin, and that is because you're lysing your muscles. That correlated with the CK absolutely makes it look like this is rhabdomyolysis. And of course, last but not least is the consideration that it's meningitis. So we go on to evaluate him, rule out, did he have an intracranial hemorrhage? His CT is normal. He has a normal blood sugar, which 
right? With hyperthyroid disease, you typically will see a hypoglycemia because you're so metabolically uh, rapidly turning over. And also hypoglycemia could present with some of that constellation of symptoms. Glucose is fine. Could be an adrenal crisis. That's the other thing we have to consider. Does he have hyperadrenalism? And is this a hyperpituitaryism that's maybe been stimulated by a septic event? So you look at all of that perspective. And then you also consider, is there a possibility that he's hypothyroid? And you think about hypothyroid because he has that loss of his uh, ankle reflexes and he has positive Babinski sign. It's a lot to think about. And then, yeah, he's 20 years old. He's 20 years old. Could he be, could this be a drug overdose? And, and you know, we've already cleared that because we looked at the drug screen, but that are, that's the kind of thing you're going to think about this differential diagnosis. Well, he really rules out for any of these. And, and so now we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on with the patient. Well, he actually uh, becomes a bit more ill. Uh, so he gets admitted to the medical intensive care unit, and his initial diagnosis is all suppositional, as it's the diagnosis for meningoencephalitis and rhabdomyolysis. And the only thing that you can do right now is manage him supportively, put him on broad spectrum antibiotics. You think he might be septic. You do vigorous fluid resuscitation. You give him basic support if he needs to be intubated, uh, if he needs vasopressors, we're going to watch all of that. And we also want to support alkaline diuresis. Now, alkaline diuresis, the reason you do that in rhabdomyolysis is that when you give uh, patients alkalizing agents, and really that's going to be, of course, sodium bicarb. And then you also use uh, mannitol to protect the brush border of the kidney from the very injurious iron pigmentation that's released when you have muscle cell lysis. So alkaline diuresis is something that you're always going to institute. So you're kind of throwing, again, even though now he's gone from the ED to the ICU, we're still throwing a big net because this is all a presumptive diagnosis. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is what it tastes like. This is what we're gonna treat because this is what we think it is right now. So coverage for encephalitis, men meningeal encephalitis, um, fluid, aggressive fluid resuscitation, alkaline diuresis for rhabdomyolysis, observation, intubation if necessary. He receives though, uh, as you do with rhabdomyolysis, you, you need to really resuscitate. And, and, and as we all know, in today's world, we're much more cautious about aggressive fluid resuscitation. And we need to be because that can cause significant injury to the lining of your blood vessels. But we're going to use a significant and aggressive fluid resuscitation in order to wash out this iron-based pigment and try to protect the kidneys. So he gets about eight liters of fluid in the first 20 hours. And his renal function has stayed normal. The creatinine went up a little bit, but he's making good urine. He has a great GFR, just like he's releasing creatinine from his skeletal muscle. And after his fluid resuscitation, his aggressive fluid resuscitation, alkaline diuresis, his CK falls rapidly back to normal by two days after his admission. So, all right, well, we're still, we're still kind of treating him suppositionally. Oh, we feel great. We treat him for rhabdo. We got better. He's on broad spectrum antibiotics. He now is more awake. He can have some cons conversation. And I'm questioning by the bedside nurse, actually, on medical ward, bedside nurse has communicated with him. And he says, oh, yeah, um, this is my second suicide attempt. And I, I took 30 pills of baclofen, five milligrams. Uh, Bifon is the, uh, the, just the brand name, right? Not the chemical name. Baclofen is the chemical name. So we took that in a, in a suicide attempt about 36 hours before he arrived to the ED. And it's really important to remember that oral baclofen takes time, not like uh, the other type of baclofen that we can give, which is intrathecal. Oral baclofen takes some time to accumulate. It also takes some time to clear. So really, really important. Two sides of that same coin takes time to accumulate, takes time to clear. If you take an overdose, it's going to take a few days for the effect of that overdose to actually blossom and show itself as it did with him, finding him unconscious on the floor of his apartment. Now here, regularly, he's supposed to be taking baclofen most of the time. He really is supposed to take it every single day because he has spasticity. And that's what baclofen is used for, to actually reduce spasticity. 
um, it's used for spinal cord injury. It's used after brain injury. It's also used to assist in alcohol or <clears throat> opioid, opioid withdrawal because it reduces that neuromuscular traffic that presents itself with fasciculations and aggressive muscle movements. So he is actually baclofen toxic. And the thing about baclofen is it's a relatively common agent to be used, but it's not part of the standard tox profile. So unless toxicology is involved and they're able to interview the patient, you might not be thinking about baclofen. And really this patient was in the hospital almost five days before the discussion and the decision was that this was a baclofen toxicity. Okay. So very important for us to appreciate and understand that the only way that we are going to assume that you have a baclofen issue, either toxicity or withdrawal, is based on a detailed medication history. And if the patient is confused or agitated or even hallucinating, which is also a possibility, not going to be an easy thing to evaluate. So recommendation, guideline recommendation is when you have patients who have this neuro presentation that you should consider the possibility of a baclofen overdose or a baclofen withdrawal. Now it's not a very good agent to, uh, and in fact, it's really rare to say that someone is trying to commit suicide by taking baclofen. It's not very effective uh, in that way. It can, of course, kill you, but it doesn't happen rapidly. And so you've taken all that baclofen. Now you're thinking, oh boy, uh, yeah, I didn't really mean to do that. And, and then what are you going to do? You, you've got to get to the hospital. We're going to try to support you. There's not much we can do to clear baclofen unless you have renal failure already. We're not going to dialyze you. We're just going to wait for that to actually be eliminated from your system. So really important to appreciate that with baclofen toxicity, the primary focus is going to be supportive. And that's what we're going to do. So we just, I want you to take a look at this because it's so interesting when you look at baclofen toxicity or baclofen withdrawal, you have a lot of similarity between their presentations. Now with toxicity of baclofen, you actually become relatively parasympathetically driven. So you see that the patient oftentimes will be hypothermic, They'll be bradycardic. They may have hypotension. They have a lot of excessive salivation and a lot of times cannot protect their airways. So you have to intubate them to help manage them. They might have tachycardian hypertension. That's typically with a really high dose. So with this patient, it's really surprising because he took 30 pills. It was 300, I think 300 of uh, baclofen. You might have expected that he would be hypertensive and tachycardic, but he really didn't have that presentation. He didn't really have much abnormality in terms of the cardiovascular structures. Neurologically, it's usually altered mental status, depression, confusion, somnolence, and catatonia, which is where he was when he first got there, and that cleared over time. You may also see that they have very significant delirium and hallucinations, really, really, really agitated. And very common with higher doses is to have coma. And when I was reading and looking at baclofen, I was thinking about a uh, in the original uh, show called The Twilight Zone, there was one twilight, I was like 10 years old, one twilight zone that just stuck with me. It was about this person who appeared not to be alive, and but he was totally awake. He was totally awake. He was alert, but he couldn't move. He couldn't talk. And he was present at his own funeral looking out of his coffin. Of course, that pretty unrealistic, right? But, but it is really important to know that with baclofen intoxication, that can actually mimic brain death because of that significant cerebral as well as spinal uh, limitation, you might actually have a positive brain death test, meaning positive for brain death. The other thing is very common to see that patients will have seizures. Okay, well you say seizures, but what about didn't we just talk about hyporeflexia and hypotonia and flaccid paralysis? Very, very important for us to appreciate that we're going to see both sides of the coin. We see an alteration in the seizure threshold. So you may have seizures, but your reflexes are going to be 
suppressed when you have toxicity with baclofen, because that's the role of baclofen is to suppress that neurotransmitter traffic, both cerebrally and spinally. If you have intrathecal baclofen, intrathecal baclofen more significantly targets spinal neurotransmission and very little cerebral. So with intrathecal, you are, are actually going to see more of uh, the neuromuscular, but much less of the sedation. So very unlikely that you would see somebody who was comatose if they had an intrathecal overdose. So pretty uncommon, only occurs really if, if there's been some issue uh, when they're receiving administration with their pump. And pretty much intrathecal, you'd suspect it probably because either your patient would have, would have had some type of surgical implantation or they might even come with a pump. Okay, so number one, number one, number one, stop the baclofen, just completely stop it. Now, the problem is that as you stop baclofen, you have to be very rigorous about looking at that every single day because once you get below toxic levels, you're now gonna have to continue baclofen to prevent the opposite side of that coin which is baclofen withdrawal. It's pretty urgent um, that you have to really look at the ability to maintain the airway, the ability to manage that excessive salivation, and you may absolutely require to be required to intubate the patient, provide some hemodynamic support. So with baclofen toxicity, you're going to withdraw the baclofen till you get to a standard level of baclofen in the blood, and then you will reinitiate the baclofen at a dose a little bit, about half of what the patient was taking before, and then you'll increase that as the days go by. It is really important to recognize that these patients can have a life-threatening emergency, and that's why you have to consider that you're going to may need to intubate and put them on uh, hemodynamic support. So I think it's really important for us to go back and sort of review very quickly what baclofen is. And it really is an agent unto itself. It really is the only agent in its category that we utilize to reduce spasticity. And that's really what the use is for. So people who work with spinal cord injured patients and uh, acquired brain injuries or over shepherd, they're very knowledgeable about baclofen. We may or may not have as much comfortability with baclofen because we might not be using it very, uh, very frequently. So really important to appreciate we talk a lot about GABA and we talk about GABA inhibition. So baclofen is, it, it actually blocks the GABA B receptor. And that's what I was saying about the category because it works at the GABA B. Benzos, alcohol, barbiturates, all are uh, GABA A agonists. And, and actually you can, you can actually uh, look at therapeutic interventions for folks that are having withdrawal by using some benzos or by using barbiturates um, and, and, and actually stimulating the GABA-A receptors as, as agonists. So very, very important to look at, uh, I think what is so incredible, of course, as we know, cerebral, spinal, and cardiac depolarization, which is primarily sodium, potassium, and calcium dependent. So when we take a look at baclofen, it works in two ways. So first of all, it works at the presynaptic inhibition. And that, when, when we inhibit at presynaptic, it prevents the influx of calcium. And so what that means is that you're gonna have a significant reduction in that impulse formation. In overdose, you will see when patients are taking too much baclofen, what you're going to see is a greater inhibition of GABA release. It's a negative feedback mechanism, and that's going to result in more likelihood for seizure. But also, when we're talking about withdrawal of baclofen, which actually affects you more at the postsynaptic inhibition, you also have seizure potential in withdrawal. So again, it's two sides of the same coin, the presentation on either side, either overdose or withdrawal you can see seizures. So again, you're not really making that decision just based on the clinical presentation because the clinical presentation is very similar on both sides. So if you just take a look at GABA-A pharmacologic agents, right? Like benzos and barbs and alcohol. These are what you see with that GABA-A agonist. And here's what you see with the GABA-B agonist. And you can see central muscle relaxation, reduction of seizure potential, 
also used for, as I mentioned before, withdrawal from opioids and withdrawal from alcohol. It's not a common way. It's not FDA approved, but a lot of people use that. So it is important for us to appreciate that that can be a therapeutic intervention. But what I think is so interesting without getting into anything else is just the fact that GABA is broken down to glutamate, glutamine. It is recycled and and basically recycled, repotentiated back into GABA. So GABA goes in a circle like so. And what we're really talking about is, are you reducing here or are you reducing here when you're talking about pre and post synaptic? So we go back to that pre and post synaptic. What I want you to remember is that presynaptic actually blocks neurotransmitter re release and postsynaptic inhibition promotes uh, well, or promotes a, a reduction in hyperpolarization. So when we have an overdose, we're gonna have an increase actually in uh, an unopposed neurotransmission, and we're gonna have an increase in hyperpolarization. Okay, so typical dosing. So oral baclofen is more common, right? Typically, we're not gonna use intrathecal unless you really have significant spasticity or we have to get you under control really quickly because we can do that really quickly with the intrathecal. Takes time with oral baclofen, right? We start around five milligrams PO, TID. You can't miss your doses and will escalate as you are tolerated about every three days. But what's really gonna be important is to remember that it's gonna take time for that oral baclofen to take effect, okay? Now, if you ingest greater than 200, up to 400 milligrams of baclofen, you're gonna be much more likely to have coma, have seizure and require intubation. So we go back and we look at, at, at Mr. BT, which stands for baclofen toxicity, Mr. BT. With Mr. BT, we see that he, he took somewhere close to 300 milligrams of baclofen in, in, in an intentional overdose. So again, you know, he's found down, he's relatively uh, comatose, he has a pulse, he is breathing, but he is found down, and that's one of the expectations that you'll have with toxicity in these, in these types of patients. Okay, so just some little issues with baclofen. First of all, oral baclofen bioavailable about 85%, and an absorption starts to occur within a few hours, but it takes time to distribute to the brain where it causes sedation and to the spinal cord where it causes muscle relaxation. So remember, that's our goal is to promote sedation and relaxation. Remember, intrathecal is more significant for relaxation than it is for sedation. But it's really important to remember it takes quite a bit of time, three to four days, actually achieving your, your, uh, your potential and what you're trying to achieve at around five to 10 days because it slowly penetrates the central nervous system. It's lipophilic. So it's, it's a slow pro uh, producer. The other thing which is really important is to appreciate that baclofen is excreted by the kidneys, okay? It has a half-life of around three hours and it's excreted by the kidneys, which tells you, first and foremost, if you have anybody who has acute kidney injury or any type of renal insufficiency, they're diabetics, uh, they have some proteinuria or albuminuria, they have some renal dysfunction, their GFR is less than 60, Baclofen is never recommended for those patients. And even at a normal dose, they could become profoundly toxic. So really important when we're taking a look at that. Okay, so overdose toxicity, right? Causes of that therapeutic use sometimes, again, remember this is not approved by the FDA, but lots of times providers will put you on baclofen for alcohol use disorder and for withdrawal from alcohol. and the reports, the evidence, the reports are that typically you have to use a little bit higher dose for alcohol use disorder, you have to use a higher dose of baclofen than you would use to just reduce spasticity. So typically those doses are a bit higher. And of course, that can lead to overdose or toxicity. Also, in general, Baclofen is not recommended for chronic pain states. So again, these are two inappropriate utilizations of baclofen, but they're not uncommon that individuals say, well, you've got chronic pain. We're going we're gonna to start you on baclofen. You're going to need a higher dose of baclofen in that case. And that, of course, can cause an over, 
overdose or toxicity to occur. And then recreational use or intentional overdose. So here are the things that basically contribute to toxicity. And of course, the one that's most important is renal failure. Now, the, the perspective is, can you dialyze baclofen? And, and I think probably most of you know that I talk a lot about dialysis, when it works and when it doesn't work. And dialysis is not recommended in order to clear the baclofen unless you already have renal impairment. So very important to say, we're not gonna dialyze your back your baclofen overdose. Some, some of you know that I think over time, we, we may have to consider being able to do CRT in the emergency department because it can assist us in clearance of uh, overdosing agents. What's probably more important in terms of clearance is total plasma exchange, which would also be quite beneficial to be able to provide for patients who are presenting with a toxic overdose like Mr. BT baclofen toxicity, BT. So really, really important to recognize that the only time dialysis is actually recommended as a first-line therapy is if you already have a renal dysfunction. And if we're evaluating you and saying, we, should we be intubating you and putting you on a ventilator? Can we clear the baclofen? And can we do that relatively quickly, which actually will shorten the time of your intubation and shorten uh, shorten your ICU stay. So that's a really important goal. We use dialysis in a patient with renal insufficiency who's taken a baclofen overdose, even if it's accidental, to actually clear enough of the baclofen so we can extubate the patient, reducing the possibility for, uh, in, for, for hospital-acquired pneumonia and other kinds of problems that occur in patients who are in the intensive care unit. So that's the only time we'll consider dialysis. But again, really, really important to remember that renal dysfunction is the major risk factor for baclofen intoxication or baclofen toxicity. Very, very important. It's unpredictable. It extends that half-life. So as you're taking your baclofen, you're not eliminating it. Your GFR is slow. You're not eliminating baclofen and it it accumulates really aggressively uh, and, and, and works very significantly, presenting oftentimes with a visualization or presentation of uremic encephalopathy. And that is actually what occurs when you've had a baclofen toxicity with renal failure. So really important. What I think, oh, sorry, I didn't finish my word here. So uh, baclofen it's really notorious for nephrologists and intensivists, maybe not for ED doctors, maybe not for NICU docs or trauma surgeons, but for intensivists and nephrologists, they're always very concerned about baclofen because it causes so much havoc. It's uniquely problematic and it is delirium producing in the patient with renal dysfunction. Now our guy didn't have renal dysfunction. It's just really important for us to remember that. Okay, now we're gonna to go to the next patient. This is Mrs. BW and that's baclofen withdrawal. So Mrs. BW, 62 year old female brought to the EMS, uh, brought to the ECC by EMS. And she is also presenting with an altered mental status and a lower extremity weakness, right? So I don't have information about her reflexology or the study of her reflexes, but she has extreme weakness on the lower, uh, on her lower, uh, extremities, and she has a really significant altered mental status. And she, her husband is coming with her, and he says he, she's been having hallucinations and altered mentation, mostly inattention, for about three days. Now, she's not coming from home, she's coming from a skilled nursing facility. So that's the first thing. Oh, she was in a skilled nursing facility. What kind of happened over there? She was hallucinating for three days. Why hasn't, why was she, she sent to the hospital sooner? She's hallucinating for three days. And on discussion with the husband, because she's not able to provide any history, but the husband says, okay, well, nine days earlier, she was discharged from a rural hospital close to where we live at following an admission for revision of T12 and L2 laminectomy with a hardware, fit, hardware failure. She had a very complicated post-op experience, which is why she is in a skilled nursing facility. She had wound dehiscence, she had multiple surgical site infections, and she had a paraspinal abscess that required incision and drainage. Okay, well, right away you say, huh, she had a laminectomy. Hmm. What kind of medications do we give patients who've had a laminectomy? But by the way, nobody really thought about it. 
right? They're, they're looking at this patient. She looks like she's septic. She has altered mental status, lower extremity weakness. She has a big history. She has a big psych history. She takes lots of medications. Her husband has a list of all her medications. And she has a lot of issues, hypertension, OSA, asthma, smoking, chronic back pain, of course, that's why she got the laminectomy. And she's on quite a few psychiatric pain medications as an outpatient. So promethazine, clonazepine, um, and of course, the big one here, gabapentin, oxycontin, oxycodone, and baclofen 20 by mouth, three times a day. So she's taking 60 milligrams a day. 80 is really the top. And remember, you start typically at five and then increase by five up by every day three. Well, right now, we don't really know. We don't really know when that was started. We're just taking the history from the husband. He's got the medication list. Nobody says, when did she start on the baclofen? When was the last time she took her baclofen? We just made the list and, and just admit her. Now, since admission, so she's coming from that skilled nursing facility, since admission to the skilled nursing facility and now into the hospital, her oral medications have been held because they were trying to figure out what's causing her delirium, what's causing her hallucinations, what's the problem here. We're going to hold all of her medications. So they've been held in the skilled nursing facility, but we're going to find out something a little bit later that's really important about her. So she goes, she's admitted to the MICU, but she's boarding in the ECC and her vital signs also, she's a little bit hypothermic, blood pressure is just a little bit low, mild tachycardia. She has a respiratory rate of 30 and her SATs are 85%. So immediately she was started on bi-level positive pressure breathing because she was hypoxic and they wanted to also help her reduce her respiratory rate, assuming that she probably had some CO2 retention or metabolic acidosis. And medications that could be contributing to her diminished mental status continue to be held, including baclofen. 72 hours post her medication hold. So she still has an altered mental status. So that actually at that point says, this is not toxicity, which is a possibility, right? And the whole concern was that's why they were holding the medication uh, and, and any one of those medications, right? The opioids, et cetera, gabapentin uh, and baclofen, holding those medications in order to see if her mental status would improve as we limited the agents and reduced the potential for toxicity. So there wasn't actually any laboratory evaluation or drug toxicity um, that actually looked at baclofen presence or absence. So really, really important to remind yourself that's not part of the standard tox screen. And here this patient is now, she's in the ECC. She's being managed by the MICU team, but she hasn't had any improvement, even though the medications have been held, okay? Now it's really important to remember that baclofen is widely used when patients have spinal issues, when they have cerebral issues, TBI, acquired brain injury, spinal cord injury, cord compression, laminectomies, in order to reduce spasticity. And it's a fine line between too little and too much. And that's really what the struggle is, is to find that appropriate method. And to remember that you have to give patients a little bit of time to respond to the baclofen. That's why the guideline recommendation is increase every three days. Don't just start at 20, but increase every three days. So cessation of baclofen is actually life-threatening. Patients can have very severe withdrawal syndromes that can actually threaten their life. So now we go back and we say, look, we really need to know a little bit more about the patient. Okay, ah, oh my gosh. She was supplied when she was discharged from the rural hospital where she had her laminectomy, she was supplied with five days of baclofen at discharge. And then she went, of course, to the skilled nursing facility, but they didn't refill the prescription and they didn't maintain her baclofen administration. So her ECC admission actually occurs eight days after hospital discharge and three days, because they started her on 20, three days after her last 20 milligram baclofen. So she's been off baclofen for three days. Armed with that knowledge, now the perspective is, ah, this is an acute baclofen withdrawal. But I mean, she's being evaluated. She's being managed by great minds and really wonderful providers, but there's not really that consideration of really investigating what happened with your baclofen. You're taking 20 milligrams three times a day. That's a really big dose. And then you have an abrupt cessation of dosing. And so 
you have this rapid proliferation of symptomatology. So armed with that knowledge in mind, she was given 10 milligrams of oral baclofen. Now, if you can't take oral baclofen, actually the standard treatment, uh, if you were not responsive to oral or you were not able to take oral baclofen, you'd get intrathecal baclofen. That's going to work really quickly and it's going to actually reverse your symptomatology very quickly. But even oral baclofen within just a few hours, you'll start to improve. She didn't require any more respiratory support or mental status started to improve just from 10 milligrams of baclofen. So it was really important. This is the patient that we're talking about that Shri is on the phone. She took care of this patient is a patient actually just like what, so that's the thing. Remember it's two sides of the same coin. It's the same kind of presentation. It's dysautonomia uh, that we look at in our patients. They might present with hypotension, but they also may present with hypertension and tachycardia, just like with toxicity, kind of lower levels of toxicity or more hypotension uh, and uh, normal heart rate, maybe even bradycardia and higher levels of toxicity, tachycardia and hypertension. And you may also present with hyperthermia. Typically, you have a, a, a lot of response to that hyperthermia and you're releasing heat. So you have goosebumps like you have with any kind of heat release methodology. And again, neurologic, right? Same kind of thing. Anxiety, agitation, hallucinations, disorientation, insomnia. Who cares? You're not sleeping. You're hallucinating, right? And this can, of course, lead to stupor coma. And it's very, very, very common to see seizure activity or rebound spasticity. And that's what happened in the case of the patient that was in the ED, Shri was taking care of it, is that he had rebound spasticity. And it, it, it actually was really, really significant. And at first, everyone thought it was a seizure. That's what it looked like, but it was not a seizure. It was rebound spasticity. That's because you have this rapid withdrawal. And now you have this unopposed neurologic stimulation and transfer, neurotransfer. So patient is hyperclonic, um, they can be myoclonic, they're hypertonic, I'm sorry, I meant to say, hyperreflexive, and they may actually have such severe hypertonicity uh, that they actually have rigid muscles and can also be confused with stiff man syndrome. So there are a lot of things that have to be worked out. And again, remember, it's, it's sort of a process of elimination because there's a lot of different things that you could have considered this was. Uh, as you were looking at her constellation of symptoms. And again, rhabdomyolysis, just like, just like with toxicity, rhabdomyolysis, all related to either in um, implemented toxicity, uh, implemented uh, hypertonicity and uh, fasciculations, if you're a toxic dose, and endogenous fasciculations, hypertonicity, because we've abruptly withdrawn baclofen. So again, the presentation is very similar. One is you've induced that hyperreflexia and the other is it's a response to the withdrawal of the baclofen. So two sides to one coin, very important. So again, always thinking about rule out is, do, do you have thyroid dysfunction? Do you have hyperthyroidism? Do you have sepsis? Do you have rhabdomyolysis? Do you have seizures? And I think one of the things that um, Sri was sharing with me about this patient in the ED was that the patient really appeared to have tardive dyskinesia, just had uncontrolled movements. They weren't seizures, but they were these uncontrolled fasciculations. So it looked very similar, what similar and, and similar in the, in the orientation to a tardive dyskinesia. And the, this patient that we had in the emergency department was doing okay for, I think he was a hallway patient, maybe for a day to two days and hadn't been receiving this back of him. And you couldn't investigate him. He first, he was a stat pack and then they identified him. And then his care provider came and came with a long list of medications, lo and behold, Everyone looked at it and they said, oh my God, it's baclofen withdrawal. And as soon as you initiate the reinstitution of baclofen, within a very short period of time, patients typically are going to respond and improve. So just a really from a fantastic article, which I'm happy to share with anybody who's interested, just looking at toxicity versus withdrawal. Okay. This one really spells it out quite a bit better in terms of saying it's much more common with toxicity to see hypothermia and death. And here with withdrawal, hyperthermia and death, 
oftentimes confused for severe sepsis, and your patient may present with multi-organ dysfunction. That's very common with baclofen withdrawal, not so much with toxicity. And then psychiatric, very similar with anxiety, agitation, paranoia, hallucinations, right? The only thing different here, and we saw it in Mr. BT, was that he was actually in a catatonic state when he was found, right? And over here with withdrawal, that's not typically how you're going to be presenting. So although the data and the literature says a couple of different things, it is really important to remember if you're toxic, you'll be hyporeflexive. If you withdraw, you're going to be hyperreflexive. That's really important. And it's also important to remember the seizure disorder occurs on either side here because you either have unopposed calcium entry or unopposed potassium entry, which promotes that neuromuscular transmission, both with respiratory failure, both with nausea and vomiting, maybe have diarrhea with withdrawal, but I don't think that's going to be a big differential. The big differential is hypoton hypotonia, hyporeflexia, with baclofen toxicity and with withdrawal that you're going to have hyperreflexia and hypertonia. And that's how uh, Shri's patient looked. He had hypertonia, he had hyperreflexia. He, 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 he went, he was really stable. And then he went down the tubes really, really quickly. She did such a fantastic job, got moved into a room, got everybody involved. Patient got intubated. And after intubation is the discovery that he was actually in baclofen withdrawal. So really important for us to remember that we have two basic types of baclofen. It's really important for us to know what the patient is receiving. With oral baclofen withdrawal, you can see lots of, lots of different presentations, but it's much more common because oral is distributed to the brain and the spinal cord. It's gonna be much more common to see agitated delirium with oral baclofen withdrawal. With intrathecal withdrawal, you see that the patient is gonna progress very rapidly to fasciculation and, and hypertonia. It's gonna be very aggressive and very, very rapid. And lots of times we have to rule that out for, for neuroleptic malignant syndrome or malignant hyperthermia because of the tachycardia, the rigidity, hypotension, et cetera. Very hard to differentiate this. So very important to remember, Intrathecal is more about the spinal cord and the skeletal muscle. So intrathecal baclofen withdrawal will have pronounced spasticity because the deficiency of the baclofen is at the spinal cord, whereas the oral agent is equally distributed across spinal cord and into the cerebral tissue. So much more notable to see neurologic, central neurologic symptomatology like delirium and hallucinations and very severe and profound agitation. So again, you look at something that's quite, in, in many ways, quite similar to what we looked at with toxicity, septic shock, meningitis, alcohol, but a couple of things that are very different. So a big rule out differentiation is, is this autonomic dysreflexia in patients who have a spinal cord injury, but who have preserved parasympathetic discharge? Is it serotonin syndrome? And serotonin, you know, we've, in this, in, in this year, we talked about serotonin syndrome in a, a patient who had an aggressive manipulation of his serotonin levels. NMS, neuroleptic syndrome, malignant hyperthermia, malignant catatonia, and catecholamine intoxication. So very similar when we, we, we look at this and we have to be thinking all the time, not us, but we're working with our providers to actually try to provide some kind of information that helps us get to a diagnosis. So I really want to talk most particularly about acute withdrawal for oral agents, right? When you acutely withdraw from oral agents, you have to manage your patient's hyperthermia, you have to manage the rhabdomyolysis, and you have to give aggressive fluid resuscitation as well as hemodynamic support. But the most important thing is start back on baclofen, but because it takes time. So you don't just say, oh, I'm gonna give a really big dose. You're gonna give the baclofen that they were taking before. So she was on 20, so we're gonna give her 20. And we're not gonna expect that to actually have resolu full resolution for about four days because that's a much slower onset. But also, I'm so sorry, I'm just gonna take one quick second because I didn't realize my battery was slow and it's just about to die. So I just wanna get my uh, plug on. So really, really important when we're thinking about that patient, we're thinking about their presentation, is that consideration of how serious are your symptoms 
And how quickly do I need to resuscitate your baclofen? So again, remember, you might use intrathecal baclofen in, uh, in an acute and life-threatening withdrawal situation. But something else that's really important is you can use other agents that will have similar effects that are either alpha agonists or GABA a, so benzodiazepines are GABA-A, and then dexamethamidine, of course, an alpha agonist. So we really think about those relationships. And these that's the beautiful thing about withdrawal. There's a lot of therapy that you can induce. There's very little that you can do about toxicity except wait for clearance and do dialysis only if there's renal insufficiency. But with withdrawal syndromes, you can see a lots of different agents are recommended for therapeutic intervention for these patients. Now, all of these, all these uh, benzodiazepines and propofol, which ultimately at breakdown point after about 24 hours actually has benzodiazepine type of effect, they're all GABA-A uh, agonists. So remember that, that baclofen is GABA-B, which is really particular, and baclofen is really the only approved agent for GABA-B agonist. And others are all approved, but they're GABA-A agonists. So that's really important for us to remember. And then of course, dexamethamidine. You can use dantrolene as well, but uh, dexamethamidine is actually the most highly recommended if we're talking about patients who are, are really unstable because of acute withdrawal. So first and foremost, if treatments fail, you gotta get started um, by intubating the patient, put them on a relatively aggressive sedation, typically start with propofol and then add in dexamethamidine. And if the patient is highly unstable, you may actually have to paralyze them in order to control that rigidity, that hypertonicity or extreme hyperthermia. So it becomes really aggressive, really, really quickly. And the methodology is a really aggressive methodology that's gonna be introduced to help control that patient. So again, I want to just remind you that if the strategy fails, and that strategy would be utilizing uh, benzodiazepines and dexamethamidine and other agents to try to get that patient under control, but if that fails, and it might, you're going to have to you know, consider doing intrathecal baclofen. It's really the definitive therapy. You've withdrawn from baclofen, I'm going to give it back to you. We're not in general using baclofen for its cerebral effects. We're using it for the spinal effects, but you have to accept the cerebral uh, sedation effects of baclofen if you're trying to achieve control of spasticity. So I think really suspicion for either toxicity or withdrawal is key. And the only way you really know that is by good history taking. So from the family, from their care providers, if possible from the patient, but highly unlikely because they're gonna be altered. They may be catatonic or they might be delirious uh, and really, really agitated. So you may not be able to get a good history from them, but that is really the key. And you wanna appreciate the two sides to that back and coin, the two sides to that same coin. And maybe Sri would tell us a little bit about her ECC case because uh, I, I didn't retrieve the MRN. So I wasn't able to look at that case particularly, but she, she did uh, share with me that that was an interesting case and was of interest for discussion. So hats off to Shri the Magnificent. That's what I'm gonna say. Shri M, Shri the Magnificent. That's my statement. And just remember with too much, you're flaccid. With too little, you're spastic. And that's really what's gonna help you diagnose, right? Hypotonicity versus hypertonicity, hyporeflexia versus hyperreflexia. Too much, you're flaccid. Too little, you're spastic. So thank you very much. I'm really happy that you're here with me today. I'm going to stop my sharing. I'm going to stop the recording. And then I'm going to ask if Shri, if you could just talk to us a little bit about your patient, if you're, uh, if you're 